It has been proposed that the left atrium is something like the HbA1c of the heart. The left atrium, beyond doubt, is a very important structure and we will see how the left atrium is affected by many diseases. First, let's take a look at the anatomy of the left atrium. The left atrium is located cranially and posterior and it consists, aside from the left atrium itself, of the left atrial appendage, the interatrial septum with the fossa valis, the primum septum and the secundum septum, and the pulmonic veins which enter the left atrium from both sides. This is a view of the left atrium from behind where we can see that the pulmonic veins enter the left atrium in pairs. This would be the left pulmonic veins and these are the right pulmonic veins. From the lateral side we can see that the left atrial appendage is in close proximity to the left ventricle, to the lateral wall and to the anterior wall. How can we visualize the left atrium with echo? First of all, in a parasternal long axis view, the left atrium lies behind the aorta. In a four chamber view, where we can see the pulmonic veins entering the left atrium, again, the left pulmonic vein and the right upper pulmonic vein. Furthermore, in a two chamber view, we see a two-chamber view of the left atrium as well with the left atrial appendage here in close proximity to the anterior wall of the left ventricle and here the pulmonic vein. This is the three-chamber view where the left atrium is also visible. We can assess pulmonic venous flow with the help of color Doppler. Here we can see the right pulmonic vein as it enters the flow, nicely seen here in red. And we can use the post wave Doppler to look at the different components of left atrial filling, for example the systolic and the diastolic filling with the retrograde wave. Just to show you the different components again, we have the systolic components with an early and a late systolic component. S1 and S2 and the diastolic components with an early diastolic part and a retrograde flow during late diastole which corresponds to left atrial contraction which we also call AR. To get a good recording of the pulmonic valve is always a challenge so uh, I'll show you how to do the post wave Doppler of the pulmonic valves in the uh, pulmonic uh, veins in this patient. We'll start from a four chamber view. The first thing you need to do is try to see the pulmonic valve a vein. We are looking for the right upper pulmonic vein. Then we use the color and what you always try should try to do is try to optimize the PRF settings. Uh, so we optimize them, we lower them a bit so that we have turbulent flow which helps us to visualize the pulmonic veins. And then we place the, the post wave Doppler signal right at the pulmonic vein and try to go in as deep as possible. And then you will get a signal where you see, okay, this seems to be okay, where you see the different components. We have the systolic component and the diastolic component and the retrograde component, the AR, uh, in diastole. Transesophageal echocardiography is particularly valuable to look at the left atrium. These are just two examples to show you how good the image quality can be with transesophageal echo and to show you that we can really even see the flow within the left atrium in this patient with severe mitral stenosis where we have slow flow phenomena in the left atrium and in particular in the left atrial appendage. There are a number of ways of quantifying the size of the left atrium. We can perform emote measurements, length measurements, area, volume measurements, and we can even quantify with the help of 3D echocardiography.
But first I want to show you just some examples of when the left atrium is enlarged. Basically, it's enlarged if the left atrial filling pressure is elevated, as for example in hypertension. This is such an example. The patient has left ventricular hypertrophy and an enlarged left atrium. Just compare the size with that of the right atrium and you can clearly appreciate that the left atrium is enlarged. Hypertension is probably the most common cause of left atrial enlargement simply because it's such a common disease. Atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation itself causes an enlargement of the left atrium. It is not only a consequence of left atrial enlargement. We can find it in mitral valve disease such as mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation and it is also present but however to a lesser degree in aortic valve disease. A few more examples coronary artery disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as you can see here in this patient we have massive left ventricular thickening, hypertrophy and a filling problem which causes dilatation of the left atrium and we see it in all other forms of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Why is size important? Simply because it's a very important outcome and risk factor. This has been shown both in atrial fibrillation and stroke and congestive heart failure and it is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular death. The size of the left atrium reflects left atrial remodeling and it reflects the integral of diastolic burden. Therefore, as I already mentioned, it has been termed the HbA1c of cardiac function. What other factors influence the size of the left atrium? Body surface area, gender, fluid status, left atrial remodeling and obviously also left atrial pressure. A standard method of measuring the size of the left atrium is M-mode. So I will now show you how to measure the left atrium with the help of M-mode. In principle, you can perform the M-mode both in the peristernal long axis and in a short axis. I will show you how to do it in the short axis. To get a good measurement, you need to cut the short axis in such a way that you can really see the opening and the closure of the aortic valve. When you have that view, you put the M mode right in the middle of the aorta and uh, be sure that you also cut the left atrium um, um, optimally in the middle and once you have that you can freeze the image and you can try to uh, or you, you should obtain an image where you can actually see the opening and the closing of the aortic valve. This is the typical box of the aorta during systole. And from this view, you would then measure the size of the aorta. You would do that end diastole, in other words, shortly before the aortic valve opens. And then you would do the same thing uh, for the left atrium, but you would do that in systole, leading edge. So, from here to here. And so, these are the measurements you would then obtain for the left atrium and also for the aorta. However, there are a number of problems involved when you use MO to measure the left atrium. One problem is that you very often don't get a perpendicular transection of the aorta and the left atrium at the same time. This is very difficult to do and it's very difficult to actually control if you really got a perpendicular view. In other words, very often will you get false diameters for the left atrium. The normal values for the MO, however, would be between 30 and 40 for males and 27 to 38 for females. I think this measurement is very valuable in everyday clinical practice even though it has its limitations obviously it does not reflect the shape and geometry of the left atrium and it does not account for the body surface area of the patient but these are the norm values that we use 50 millimeters would be the cutoff value between normal and abnormal and if the left atrium is above 70 to 75 millimeters, we would call the left atrium severely enlarged. A more exact way of looking at the left atrium is by calculating the area.
I will now show you how to measure the left atrial area, which is obviously more exact than measurements that we get from the M mode or from uh, 2D measurements, uh, which just measure distance. Again, what we need is we need a good four chamber view where we see the left atrium in its full dimensions. Then we again freeze the left, uh, the, 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 the image in systole. Okay. And then we perform an area measurement where we begin somewhere uh, in this region where the anterior mitral valve uh, inserts. And then we trace the left atrium. However, we have to be sure that we do not measure into the pulmonary veins or left atrial appendage. And then we would close the area measurements at the level of the mitral valve. And so we get a measurement of 18.5 square centimeters, which is normal. Here are the reference or normal values. Below 20 would be normal. Above 40 would be severely enlarged. Again, take a look at the fact sheets where you can find the reference values to download. With the calculated area and the length, we can actually calculate the volume with the help of the so-called area length method. But it's also possible to directly calculate the left uh, atrial volume with the help of the so-called biplane method. Let's take a look at this. More exact than the 2D measurements and the M mode measurements and the area measurements is obviously volume, the volume measurement of the left atrium. So how do we do this? Again, we first need a good four chamber view. Again, we freeze the image in systole when the left atrium is at its largest size. And then we go into the Simpson or biplane measurement program. And we do the same thing as we did previously for the area. We contour the left atrium, trying not to go into the left or, uh, left or right pulmonary veins and we then get the length of the left atrium we can change that to adapt to the true length of the left atrium and finally we end up with a volume in this case it would be 33 milliliters but this is only based on a monoplane method if you want to do it biplane we have to do the same thing again here in a two chamber view Very similar. Again, we trace the left atrium. Oops. And so here we go. We get another measurement for the two chamber view. And then by calculating using the Simpson method, we can get a biplane left atrial volume. Here are the normal values of left atrial volume for both males and females. You will see that there's a fairly large variation in the size because it very strongly depends on the fluid status and also on the body surface area and other factors. What are the pitfalls? When you contour the left atrium, you have to avoid to include the pulmonary veins in your measurements. You should not measure the tented area of the mitral valve. You should really try to get the entire left atrium on the screen, so you should uh, avoid alignment problems and foreshortening. Beware of lateral resolution, dropouts in the lateral region, and you should really measure at the end of systole. One thing that I also want to mention, which is an important additional finding, is that of the position of the interatrial septum. If the interatrial septum bulges, for example here to the right, this is indicative of elevated left atrial pressure. We can see a patient with rheumatic mitral stenosis. If it bulges to the left, it's indicative of elevated right atrial pressure. This is a patient who had pulmonary hypertension. There are a number of indirect signs of elevated filling pressure. One is the dilated and expanded left atrial appendage. This is such an example. You can see a patient with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a huge expanded left atrial appendage. You can see that very nicely here in the two-chamber view.
Another sign, we already mentioned that, is the bulging of the interatrial septum towards the right. And something you can sometimes also see are dilated pulmonic veins. You can see them in the four-chamber view, but sometimes also in other views. It's very important to emphasize that atrial contraction is very important for cardiac function. Loss of sinus rhythm and A wave reduces stroke volume by 10 to 25 percent. And this reduction or the importance of atrial filling is even more important in patients who either have a filling problem altogether, for example, aortic stenosis or hypertension, and it is also more important during exercise. Actually, it's very difficult to really assess left atrial function. The method that is probably best is to use the Doppler signal across the mitral valve and to look at the E and the A wave. We'll be talking about that in length when we talk about diastolic function. You can also use the pulmonic vein. However, this does have its limitations and it's very difficult to perform on a routine basis. Some have proposed to look at the fractional area change between systole and diastole, but this too has its limitations and is certainly not a routine method to look at atrial function. Newer methods include tissue Doppler, which might have a role, and also speckle tracking, which might also have a future. Here's an example of a patient who underwent a MACE procedure, in other words, a technique where atrial fibrillation was treated. And what you can nicely see here that before the procedure, the patient had atrial fibrillation, or at least he did not have sinus rhythm. There is no A wave. And then after the procedure, very nicely, an A wave is noted, and there also seems to be adequate atrial filling, and the patient improved significantly. There are several reasons for an impairment of left atrial function. It is well established that patients who have chronic atrial fibrillation show left atrial scarring, which causes remodeling and is a consequence impairment of function. Other reasons include post-cardioversion or ablation, where we see atrial stunning, aging, chronic left atrial afterload, such as in mitral stenosis, and even medical therapies such as chemotherapy have been suspected to cause impairment of left atrial function. So this concludes the subchapter on the left atrium. But be sure, we'll come back to the left atrium in other chapters, and there we will see which role the left atrium plays in the various disease entities.